is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest serving monarch in British history, died at the age of 96. The world has mourned and eulogized her. However, some have criticized the monarchy's colonial past, both in Africa and abroad. Enthroned at just 25, she was at the helm for 70 odd years. She died at a time opinion is sharply divided about the future of the Commonwealth. The Queen's history is intertwined with the involvement of the British Empire overseas, particularly in Africa, India and the Caribbean. As the head of the Commonwealth, she played a pivotal role in Britain's international affairs. In Africa, 20 countries, including Nigeria, Ghana and South Africa, are members of the Commonwealth. So this week on the program, we look at how Africa remembers a Queen Elizabeth II, interrogate the legacy of the British Empire on the continent, and thrash out what the future might hold for the Commonwealth under King Charles III, 73, the new monarch and the late Queen's son. I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Well, the Queen's ties to Africa can be traced to Treetop Hotel in Kenya, then a British colony. It was while there that she received the news of the death of King George VI, her father. Kenya was her first stop in a tour of the Commonwealth she had embarked on in place of her ailing father. When news of the Queen's death broke across Africa, reactions were varied and mixed. Now, while some were saddened by her loss, others were unmoved or just indifferent. Let's take a listen. I think generally on a global landscape, we can't deny that she was an icon, uh, a very, you know, amazing figure, a public figure that she was. But in terms of now boiling it down to, you know, as citizens here, especially in Zimbabwe on the ground, I mean, it's, it's been a while. It's no secret that we haven't had uh, good relations with the UK for the longest time. Um, so we've never really seen or experienced any, you know, input or you know, hand in her works here in Zim. Um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's a really great loss um, globally. I don't really know her relevance to the youth of South Africa today. I feel like I'm very pro decolonize education in South Africa. I'm a law, I'm a law student, so um, I'm very much for educating South African future law students and future students within the context of South Africa, decolonizing that education and getting us back to our roots. She was a very patriotic woman and a very caring and loving woman. And how she was even instrumental in, 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 in ensuring that the Commonwealth uh, nations from, which started from five and seven, sorry, that uh, today about 50, 50 countries a part of the Commonwealth and that she was very, very key because she visited almost all of the Commonwealth countries. I'm not quite moved or really affected by it. I feel like she's a human being like any, any one of us. Passing, passing of a loved one is never good. And she wasn't uh, my favorite person, obviously because of the colonialism and all of those, uh, you know, bad, bad attachments in history, but I mean, she's, she was loved by family. Well, let's now bring in our panel. Joining me from Johannesburg, Professor David Monyai, international relations and foreign policy expert. And in London, Dr. Sue Onslow, director and reader in Commonwealth history at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, School of Advanced Studies, University of London. A warm welcome to both of you and thank you for being a part of this discussion. Let me start off with you, um, Dr. Onslow. You know, Queen Elizabeth II is the longest serving British monarch. She came to the throne at the age of 25, and while leaders and people from every corner are mourning and celebrating her long life, some reaction has been rather divided about the legacy of the monarch. Briefly, how do you remember the Queen? Personally, I remember the Queen, having met her, uh, with admiration, deep respect. It's a, it's a very strange feeling to be here in London with the uh, memorial services and of course the vigil which is taking place down in, in Westminster, half a mile from where I am. As far as I'm concerned, she was part of uh, 
the, the, the landscape of my everyday world from, from when I was born. So it honestly feels in a bizarre way as if the ground has shifted under my feet. It's a very odd sensation, even though, of course, this, the sad moment of, of her death was long expected. All right. Uh, Professor Bonya, your thoughts here, because, um, you know, many African countries have a, a lot of links, strong links, if I may say that, to Britain. What's your view? How do you remember the Queen? The first thing that one has to say as an African is that we do not speak ill of the dead. But however, um, there is a way of looking at the Queen, the person, uh, and no doubt I agree with my uh, counterpart uh, that she was a pleasant person, respected. Uh, but uh, from an African perspective is that she also carried a heritage, a heritage that some uh, sees it as a, a proud, um, a way of Britishness. Um, however, uh, on the African continent, uh, our own ancestors uh, suffered a great deal under the British monarchy that she represented. And unfortunately, she never apologized for the atrocities committed uh, by the monarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, we have endless cases here in South Africa where um, African leaders, um, kings like uh, um, in the Kosa uh, uh, kingdom, right. uh, who's, uh, who were killed and their heads taken to, to, to UK. And then if you look at the entire British Museum, it's full of uh, stolen heritage, African heritage that is supposed to be returned. However, the contradiction is that uh, is the same queen that uh, her entire reign uh, was decolonizing, right. uh, modernizing, uh, and in a way she really played a critical role even in the post-independent uh, and through the Commonwealth. Therefore, if there's this mixed uh, record that uh, carries with it um, a mixed record, particularly for the Africans. Right. So I want to look at that mixed record a bit, uh, uh, Dr. Onslow, because, you know, opinion is clearly divided over the legacy uh, of the Queen and of the of the monarchy, because you've heard what Professor Monyai has just said, particularly when it comes to how Africa views uh, the past with Britain. I mean, you know, even as those in Africa joined the rest of the world in mourning Queen Elizabeth, what is dividing opinion and why is that opinion so divided? I think that precisely as uh, Professor Munyai has, has pointed to, that it's a it's a complex a complex life and a complex legacy. That the persona of the Queen had come to be seen as so fused with the institution of the monarchy, the Queen as monarch and monarchy, um, and it, it it's a complicated picture that um, the, the of uh, of legacies, uh, particularly in the other parts of the former. Um, British Empire in the Caribbean, legacies of slavery, the push towards uh, uh, demands for reparations for the, the lasting traumas of and, and effects of of that abomination. Um, the, the, the royal family has never apologized for that, mm -hmm. um, and there, there is anger there. So that similarly, there is there are the complicated complicated strains and strands. But as as Professor Munya said. The, the, the Queen oversaw transition to independence and was determined to ensure that newly independent states um, got the support, got the recognition, got the le legitimacy, and she sought to enable their, their trajectory post-independence in any way that she could by lending her soft powers. So it's a complex, um, a very complex story, but I completely agree about the debate about the return of stolen artifacts, which is a very, very necessary and ongoing discussion. Uh, Professor Monyai, uh, South Africa's EFF has particularly come out strongly um, on this matter, though, because, you know, apartheid held sway until 1994. And, and the EFF has most recently accused the monarchy of complicity and of refusing to acknowledge past ills. Do you feel that this is still very much the feeling uh, of other former colonies in Africa? Oh, indeed. I think what we're having is the rise of, uh, for the lack of a better term, uh, of a forgetting generation, that the much younger generation have uh, no links to the colonial past. Uh, they don't carry the same or feel the same affinity towards um, the queen. 
uh, Northern Monarchy or Britain itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the linkages, uh, trade is declining with Britain. Uh, immigration issues, uh, cultural, Britain is no longer the same. It's no longer the Britain of 1960s and 70s and 80s, right. where it welcomed uh, all people of the world. Um, at the moment, it's a, uh, an insular Britain that has its own uh, crisis uh, with the potential a breakup. Um, and its economy at the, at the global scale is declining much faster. It's a matter of time in a year or two. Uh, India, former British colony, will be a higher ranking than Britain itself. Right. And therefore, it's a Britain that depends on the United States. Um, and some of the action taken by some prime ministers within Britain uh, are detrimental to Africa. Um, for instance, the 2011 bombing of Libya, uh, that Britain was in the forefront. It right. destroyed the state. And therefore, some of these issues uh, created this distance uh, with Britain. Uh, and therefore, you get these views uh, among the younger generation that they don't really want to do anything with the monarchy. Right. Let me bring this conversation to uh, the Commonwealth, uh, you know, as one of the key, uh, uh, you know, organizations that has tried to bring former colonies, uh, former British colonies together. Because Dr. Onslow, you know, the Commonwealth was founded in 1949. And in 1953, Queen Elizabeth II was head of state in 32 of those uh, Commonwealth nations when she came to the throne at just 25. Now, to the average layperson, though, very little is known of the tangible benefits of the union for its members. What is the Commonwealth about? The Commonwealth certainly had its roots in, in empire. It, it, it dates back to, to well before 1949. That's taken as the start point of the modern Commonwealth with uh, the Declaration of London and India uh, um, as a republic, staying a member of the Commonwealth with the crown as a symbol of the free association um, of originally eight members. And of course, the Commonwealth expanded dramatically. Um, but I want to pick up on a number of points that uh, the professor has made about this question of the generational shift and the, the, the shift in the, the sense of connectivity with the UK and an erosion of the sense and understanding of what, what is the Commonwealth. It has multiple meanings for multiple people. Um, and the Commonwealth emerged um, and evolved, certainly, thanks to the energy and input of key post-independence nationalist leaders who sought to use the Commonwealth as a platform for development and to promote social justice and racial justice. And the Queen was the ceremonial head of that. It's very interesting that Prince Charles, as he was, in the Kigali meeting of the Commonwealth, um, heads of government meeting, used the platform to say the time is now to have the important discussions, the difficult conversations about legacies of slavery. He clearly wants to use the Commonwealth as a platform to find solutions to this, rather than simply being um, a symbol of the problem which I think is positive, but these are going to be necessary and difficult discussions going forward. But um, certainly that in that speech, he did not issue a formal apology because that of course would have legal implications for the British government. But the, the sense of um, understanding of what is the modern Commonwealth, right. what are the relationships? I fully understand why there's a sense of complete disconnect for um, African, young Africans. And of course it's overwhelmingly a young continent. Well, if you talk about, uh, Dr. Onsel, if you talk about uh, the, the original ideals of the Commonwealth being, you know, part of it was to promote social development, do the ideals that originally bound all these countries uh, in the Commonwealth, do they still exist? I mean, what exactly were those ideals and what are they today? The Commonwealth really worked at its best when it was um, part of a problem-solving network. So uh, it... Um, started to, to market itself as a values-based association promoting democracy, good governance, and human rights really in the 1990s under the African Secretary General, uh, Chief Emeka Yoko. Um, but it has a charter which declares aspirational human rights as, as universal rights. But um, like um, other uh, members of the international community, Commonwealth members can have a very varied track record um, as far as human rights are, are concerned. Um, where it, the, so the, the, it's very interesting that the modern Commonwealth continues to expand. It has just uh, welcomed in two new African member, members, Gabon and Togo. And 
uh, smaller developmental states, smaller states who see the value of different Anglophone networks that do not include the United States, that do not include China, um, and the, the potential networking possibilities that these offer in terms of um, education, culture, trade. So we should, that's why the Commonwealth has this complex right. multiplicity of strands going into it. All right. Uh, Professor Munyai, your thoughts on that? Uh, indeed, I agree fully with that. But the, uh, perhaps the bigger question or the elephant in the room is what is it that Britain as the head of Commonwealth, uh, the lead, the original, the originator, um, mm -hmm. what is it that it can provide? What is the utility uh, of this body if a trade is on the decline, um, if developmental assistance and strategic partners, whatever name you give it, is no longer uh, that strong. Um, if universities in Britain are close to most Africans, um, if Britain is not championing African cause and African agenda within global multilateral uh, institutions such as United Nations Security Council. Um, and the bigger question is that what is this association for? Um, I think it's, it still has utility, uh, association. Uh, it is changed in form. It won't have a strong uh, British uh, as an anchor. Uh, um, I think you're going to have much more your Nigeria, your South Africa, uh, India, playing in Canada, playing much more in Australia, a much more a bigger role beyond the imperial dimension of Commonwealth. And we are talking of a total different animal. Um, and therefore, we can't compare the Commonwealth to Brits or any other associations that uh, more countries are lining up to join because uh, right. It increases trade, it increases association with lots of benefits, uh, mm -hmm. and therefore we need to ask the utility uh, of, of, of the structure. All right. O on that note, though, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we will look at the relevance of the Commonwealth, how effective it has been over the years, and what its future might look like. To stay with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Talk Africa. Let's continue with our discussion now. Uh, still joining me in Johannesburg, Professor David Monyai, and in London, Dr. Sue Onslow. Dr. Onslow, let me start off with you. What is it that the Commonwealth can provide now, you know, with Britain being the lead in the Commonwealth? What is it that can provide in modern day Africa today? Although the King Charles um, is the ceremonial head of the Commonwealth, it has its political head, which is Baronet uh, Patricia Scotland as the Secretary General. So this is um, an association of equal sovereign states based on, they operate on the basis of consensus. Britain is not head of the Commonwealth. Britain doesn't lead in the Commonwealth. In fact, there are important sensitivities mm -hmm. which successive British governments have to be attuned to, that any sense of British um, trying to lead um, is, is rightly uh, viewed with suspicion because of the, the former imperial relationship. So Britain, if it is to be effective, has to contribute and to support. It is one of the major donors um, within the Commonwealth, along with Canada and Australia. But I completely agree that the financial resources available to the Commonwealth are, are, are tiny, 24 million for the International Secretariat. So the benefits of the Commonwealth come through its networking and that it, it where its, its, its meetings overlay with other, other meetings and how it can contribute to ideas and processes daisy chaining around the world. But I really want to, to underline Britain is not head of the Commonwealth. It's an intense uh, However, the Queen and or, or Prince Charles or King Charles the Dead. That's the great uh, paradox. This, uh, comes in, comes in and sits along there. Symbolically, uh, you still have an imperial dimension to Commonwealth. You can't and, deny 
and there is an, that this is the great paradox of you have a thousand year old hereditary institution rep representing a modern thoroughly modern organization which is based upon equal sovereign states but of course there are five other heads of states who are, uh, uh, are monarchs inside the commonwealth so this, there, there is as i say this anomaly and then there is a there has been a push to well to replace um, the ceremonial head of state with with something else. Big debate about that. Um, should it be done away with? Who should take? Who should do this? Who would pay for it? Would it rotate? How? And so until these issues are resolved, they're staying with the status quo. But this is a live debate. Is there a feeling, though, um, uh, Dr. Onslow, because some critics have argued that the Commonwealth is perhaps now outdated and, and becoming irrelevant. I mean, do you agree with that? I, it's, I completely agree that the lack of visibility and the Commonwealth's inability to communicate a clear single purpose message definitely damages the work that it can do. Um, the Commonwealth, though, does have um, a track record on promoting debate around climate change. And uh, it's notable that uh, before the Paris summit, Commonwealth heads were at a meeting, got together, crafted a Commonwealth standpoint representing nearly one third of the world's um, countries and went into the Paris negotiations with the United Front and helped to contribute to the, the outcomes of that successful international meeting. So the Commonwealth can, but will it? It's often um, held up as, as offering great potential going forward, but right. its cynics say, no, it, it, it constantly fails to live up to its potential. Um, it does have value, though. Um, Dr. Munya, do you feel that the Commonwealth is outdated and irrelevant, or does it still have a place in modern-day society? I think the simple answer is yes and no. Um, uh, the main point is it's a declining institution. Um, it still has a utility, well, the language that we are using, uh, English, um, a literature that we love, and for most of us, there's this love and hate. Um, it really depends what you're talking. There's a lot of affinity to U uh, UK and Britain, uh, but uh, the uh, sense that uh, when we have the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, mm -hmm. you listen to uh, UK, what role did it play uh, mm -hmm. to assist uh, Commonwealth countries? It's nothing. Um, it shut its doors. Um, um, what you uh, vaccine nationalism, um, it looks the other way around. I mean, it, uh, much more with the developed countries. So I think real relationship, as we say, right. uh, it's seen during the dark hours. And, and I don't think the current Britain uh, is playing that role uh, to really strengthen the bond that unites uh, the common. Dr. Onslow, because even as you mentioned that the, the Commonwealth has helped the world uh, in certain aspects to negotiate, you know, it does talk about the importance of uh, democracy, tackling climate change, uh, human rights and so forth. But it isn't a logical framework, though, internationally to deal with any of those problems. So how effective has it been in those areas, particularly when you talk about it helping to negotiate? Um, the Commonwealth, of course, heads of government meeting only meets every every two years. Other international organizations or regional organizations meet much more often, and so have that that close the, the social capital that comes with these with these meetings of leaders and their officials. Um, the Secretariat is is very much smaller um, here in London than it was when it what used to be in the 1980s a mini UN that supported development, technical expertise, um, trade negotiations, debt management. So um, the Commonwealth's capacity has been reduced. And it, do I see it um, making significant uh, contributions going forward? I hope that there is going to be a Commonwealth um, coming together in the lead up to the Commonwealth climate, uh, to, I'm sorry, to the climate change in Sham El Sheikh in November of this year. Um, I'm very concerned there wasn't one last year before Glasgow. Uh, because if, for the Commonwealth to have meaning, heads have to get together, uh, officials have to, official, to network, civil society organizations also have to have bigger visibility in terms of, of underpinning the practical, uh, addressing practical problems, uh, providing practical solutions. All right. I'm going to get your winding up comments in a minute, um, ending the program. Uh, 
Professor Manya, let me start off with you with your final thoughts because 2.4 billion people are part of the Commonwealth. You know, that's a third of the world's population. It represents the last residues of British colonial past. Now, some have called for a reset vision to deliver a common future. So what is it today? Is it just a continuation in your view of British legacy or has it become a platform to meaningfully engage African countries on an equal basis? What does the future hold? I think the future centers around uh, the ability of Britain to honestly um, apologize, uh, provide reparation um, to Africa and Caribbeans uh, for slavery, um, to genuinely return all stolen heritage that sits um, in museums um, in, in, in Britain, and going beyond, I mean, to demonstrate leadership and issues of human rights, norms and value, not in a selective way. Uh, Britain has to stop selling arms to Yemen, where massive people are dying. And some of these interventions that Britain uh, follows the United, uh, United States and NATO bombing in Afghanistan, bombing in Iraq, uh, these walls of choice has to come to an end and uh, ensure that Britain plays a critical role within the United Nations Security Council for reforms to benefit uh, Africa and other uh, outsiders um, and, and deal with developmental issue, uh, sustainable development uh, measurements and open up um, to uh, issues of uh, university exchange programs, technolo technology uh, exchange and transfer. So those are core issues that uh, brings a meaning to the Commonwealth. And Britain cannot do this alone. Uh, Canada, Australia, South Africa, Nigeria, India must also contribute to that agenda, a developmental agenda, not an imperialist um, that uh, looks the other side and speak a language of human rights while uh, in reality, uh, it's a it's a violator of human rights itself. Dr. Onslow, you have the final word. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I in, in no way am um, uh, holding up the UK as a paragon of virtue on human rights or, or, or practices of foreign policy, um, because uh, there are a multiplicity of challenges and, and very contentious policies which are which are being followed at the moment. Um, but I do think that there needs to be a, a structural readjustment from the developed world to, the, to support the developing world, because Britain is one of the big emitters, uh, because climate change really is the, the existential threat. And African states uh, contribute, I think it's 4% to global emissions, but are, are at the forefront of those states, countries, societies, peoples who are bearing the brunt of it. So there has to be a... a, a greater focus um, to address the multiplicity of, um, of what climate change is doing to African countries and those developing states that need the support of climate finance, recognition of climate refugees, um, and to, to appreciate the, the very real need that um, to, to address these issues. The Commonwealth in the past has been an organization which has sought to undo what was done. So I, if it does have a place, it has to fulfill in a proper way um, that it will continue to undo what was done in the past. All right, uh, Dr. Onslow, Professor Manyai, to you both, thank you so much. And that's all we have time for on this edition of Talk Africa. A big thank you to our panel of experts. In Johannesburg, Professor David Manyai, international relations and foreign policy expert. In London, Dr. Sue Onslow, Director of RIDA in Commonwealth History at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, School of Advanced Studies, University of London. Remember, you can be a part of this conversation through our social media platforms on Facebook and Twitter. And you can also watch this and other editions of Talk Africa on our YouTube playlist. Do join us again next week for more Talk Africa. From me, Beatrice Marshall and the team here in Nairobi. Until next time, bye-bye.